what is the gospel? Now, the gospel isn't really a word we use these days in the common vernacular in our everyday language, um, it, especially outside of a religious context. Like I was trying to think of the instances in which you would say the word gospel in everyday life. Um, potentially, if something's gospel truth or, uh, or even um, the uh, evangelical African-American uh, gospel choirs, as uh, was it Harry and Megan's wedding. So uh, not really a word which we're commonly acquainted with every day. Um, so like every other person these days, probably, you jump online and define gospel. So this is literally a snip um, off my computer screen. So we have three different um, definitions of gospel. The first one being gospel is the teaching or revelation of Christ, which many people would probably be aware as the context it puts there, it is the church's mission to preach the gospel. Um, very similarly, the dot point underneath, the thing that is absolutely true, what I just said previously, the gospel truth in that sense, or even a set of principles or belief as in the, um, the context it gives is a gospel of market economics. So um, it's almost like a set of rules, set of things you live by being gospel, especially in a religious context. Uh, the second uh, definition it gives is the record of Christ's life and teaching in the four books, the New Testament, that being Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospels commonly recurred, uh, referred to from this platform as the four gospels. And a couple of those uh, we will see tonight, a couple of passages we'll have on the screen from the four gospels. And then lastly, um, the, the fervent style of black African evangelical religious sing singing, um, as I also mentioned. However, our topic tonight is what is the gospel specifically to do with the Bible? Um, what is the gospel in the Bible? And um, this resource many of you will um, recognize as from Esword. Uh, this is a, a snip from a Strong's Concordance, which a uh, concordance being a compilation of all the words that um, the Bible used because the Old Testament was predominantly written in Greek, the New Testament predominantly in Hebrew. And therefore, when the Bible got translated into English, it, um, the, they, the translators compiled a book in which you go, okay, this word in Hebrew is these sometimes three, four, five different, six different words in English because the two languages aren't always compatible. So uh, the translators compiled this book called the Strong's Concordance, very top of that tab there. And when we look up um, the reference number G2097, the gospel literally means in Greek, a good message that is the gospel so technically at the start of our talk we, we could have had on the slide well what is the gospel we could have had what is the good news okay so uh, a logical step from here well would be to do well let's do a, a gospel search of the bible using a resource such as esword and uh, i've only selected three different passages from the gospel of matthew we have um, matthew chapter 4 verse 23 um, Actually, this verse, the next and the one after, that all the context of the verses are all at the start of Jesus' ministry. When he first started to go out at 30 years old, he started preaching in Galilee and then went out to all of Israel, preaching um, the gospel, as it says in Matthew 4, verse 23. Um, Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel. There's our, there's our word, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of diseases among people. Okay, so Jesus taught this gospel and it's had to do with this kingdom, the good news of the kingdom. We have the gospel of Mark this time, same similar context at the start of Jesus' ministry. Uh, Mark 1 verse 15 saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel, believe the good news. Okay, so I've got a few, few more ideas of what this gospel is from our search of the word gospel. So we have, again, the kingdom of God at hand. It's probably safe to assume that Jesus preaching the gospel of the kingdom and Mark's the kingdom of God at hand is the same thing. Then we have this idea of repent ye, so changing our ways. And then we have to believe the gospel. So we're starting to get a bit more of a picture of an idea of what this gospel entails. Uh, lastly, the gospel of Luke, chapter 18, similar context again, actually, this verse is a quotation of Isaiah. Um, as, as the record goes, um, Jesus stands up in the synagogue in Galilee and opens the Torah, which is the, um, so the synagogue being the Jews' church almost, 
and he opens the Torah, which is their Bible, and starts reading Isaiah, which is um, this reference. And afterwards, after this reference, is the uh, record goes on, this day is this word fulfilled in your ears. So Jesus is going, this is talking about me. So Luke 4, verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus, um, as he was saying, because the spirit of the Lord is on Jesus. Why? Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel, preach the good news to the poor, and hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recover the sight of the blind, and set at liberty them that are bruised. Now, that, that is prophesaical in the Old Testament, but yet Jesus goes, this passage I'm fulfilling um, today in your ears, back when he read this. So from these three verses, you can kind of pretty much got a good picture of what the gospel entails. We've got, we've got a kingdom, repenting, we've got to believe it, and it's the thing that Jesus preached. Well, luckily enough, in um, Acts chapter 8, verse 12, we have a very succinct um, a succinction of what the gospel actually entails, even though it, it covers a wide variety of things. So in Acts chapter 8, uh, which says, but when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both when men and women. Now you're probably going, well, where's our gospel gone? Where, where's the good news? And this is one of the things that um, the translators, it's one of those instances where the translators have used a different word because our English language is different. So we have the word preaching here, which is the word gospel. So we could technically say um, they believed when Philip was gospeling the things concerning or, or preaching the good newsing, preaching the good news are the things. Okay, so there's our word gospel and it concerns the things um, the things concerning the kingdom of God, for firstly, and the name of Jesus Christ. And because when they believe those things, they are baptized. So, was Philip preaching something different to the gospel that Christ was preaching? Even though our verse here says that the gospel, what Philip was preaching, is concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. Well, we can see that it is the same gospel because Jesus speaks about this same gospel in the gospel of Matthew, Mark and Luke, um, all of them being synonymous records because the gospel is the same account of Jesus' ministry just written by four different perspectives. So they have the same kind of stories, uh, accounts, but yet from four different perspectives. Therefore you get slightly different details, slightly different um, vision points on things almost. So um, I'll read the Luke 18 verse 29 one, but they're all effectively the same verse. Uh, and he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house, or parents, or brethren, or wife, or children, for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time, or in the world to come, life everlasting. So this, the context is Jesus talking about the gospel, talking about the things to, um, concerning the kingdom. And he says that no one has left um, house, brethren, wife, children for the kingdom of God's sake. There's one of our two key things that will not receive more in, etern in the kingdom of God. But the thing about these three different verses, we have the three different things of the gospel that Philip mentioned, um, just proving that Christ also talked about the same thing. So in, in Matthew's account, it was for my name's sake. That was one of the two things. Um, Mark clarifies that for, for my sake and the gospels. So we're still talking about the same thing. And synonymous in Luke, we have the kingdom of God's sake. So we can all see these three different people all picked up on the same thing, but are focused on three different things. But they're all to do with the gospel. The name of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God is on about the gospel. So it's pretty safe to assume, or what is that good news? What is the gospel? It's the thing to do with the kingdom of God and to do with Jesus Christ. Now, we could go home all happy as Larry tonight. We've learned what the gospel is. I could sit down at the end of the, end of the uh, lecture. But um, I want to go further and impress or, or why is it important to know the, uh, what the gospel is? Uh, or what does it affect us? So, uh, how does um, the knowledge of what the gospel should affect us? So I want to uh, push further as to what exactly are two of these aspects. Why is it important to know and why do we, why do we need to um, respond? So our first thing... I want to look at as well, why is it important to understand the gospel? Why is it important to understand the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ? 
Well, firstly, if you're going to believe it, but um, we'll get there. But just so we're all on the same page, um, we need to know our state before God. And that is, or we need saving. We're in this state of death and mortality, and that is our state before God. Uh, probably a well-known verse that we all know, John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his begotten Son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish in that state of death, but have this different state of everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world, condemned the world, and by that, um, Jesus was an upright man who walked perfectly before God. Jesus didn't sin. And so Jesus could have walked on this earth and gone, yep, you're sinful, you're sinful, you're remaining in this, this camp of death and mortality. But it doesn't say that, does it? Verse 17, he came into the world not to condemn the world to that state, but that the world through him might be saved to this state of life, eternal life. But then through him, there has to be a process from death to life. And so that process is salvation. So again, reiterating a, first, reiterating a few things from verse 16. Whosoever believes on him should not perish. So we need to believe in this process which Jesus is the saviour of. So it's a process of salvation in which Jesus is the saviour. And to have that everlasting life. So go from death process of salvation salvation with Jesus as the saviour to life everlasting. Uh, to prove this, the gospel has the power to salvation. So, so this process of salvation is the gospel. That's seen in Romans 1 verse 16, where Paul is writing this instance. Um, and he says, for I, Paul, am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why isn't he ashamed? Because it has the power of salvation to everyone that believeth. So he knows uh, he's in this state of mortality and it has the power of salvation, this process, to life. And just note at the end, it has to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We'll come across um, a couple of things like that. So just store that in the back of your head. So the gospel has the power to salvation. This process from death to life, the gospel is the key. Just to reiterate it, um, this is... This quotation in Mark 16 is at the end of Jesus' ministry. In Mark 16, when he, Jesus says to his disciples, to go into all the world, preach the gospel unto every creature. That's old, old English, um, creature being every human. Um, and he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So he, he that believes that the gospel has the power to salvation and believes in that gospel will have life everlasting. But he that believeth not will remain in that state of death and mortality. Uh, or as it puts it here, shall not be damned or condemned. So, this is process of salvation with Christ as the Saviour. But how important is it to understand what that process is? Uh, this verse is probably more of an uh, application to me for the next half an hour, 45 minutes. Um, but nevertheless, Galatians 1 verse 8, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, that um, to you than which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Okay, so th there are different ideas of what the gospel is, different interpretations of the Bible, but what it's saying here, we need to be sure in our own minds what this process of salvation is, because remember, if the, go the gospel is the key to salvation, we need to understand the gospel in order to be sure that it's the same gospel that Christ preached. Because if you think about it logically, let, um, let him be accursed if anyone's preaching to any other different way of salvation. Because if I'm preaching a different way of salvation, I'm causing everyone who listens to me to not understand and not know what that process is. And therefore not getting to the life everlasting. So it's literally a matter of life and death as to if we understand the gospel or not. Now I know I've gone through a, a fair few things um, quickly, um, hopefully we'll um, made some groundwork, but we're just going to do a recap of where we are so far, and then I'll go through a, a more slower pace, but I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. So, gospel is the good news. We saw that, uh, that was the original meaning of the Greek, and that gospel, the same gospel that Jesus proclaimed and taught, the gospel includes the two things, things concerning Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. Also, our state, we need saving from this state of death and mortality but yet the gospel has that power to salvation 
And it's vital that we understand the gospel because it, we need to believe it because it is that process to life everlasting. So, as we looked in our um, slides, Jesus went about preaching the gospel and it's pretty evident that the gospel is in the New Testament because that, that's what Jesus preached. That's the very thing you probably had a, in your mind before you came here tonight because that's what the, the, the church has preached. They preach the gospel. But if you come to our reading, Galatians chapter 3, in verse 8, we have something of a slight different, so I'm going to jump back into the Old Testament. So who was the gospel preached? Well, there's all those people um, back in Jesus' time. But in Galatians 3 verse 8, it says that the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, the heathen being, being Gentiles, just a bit of old English, through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham. Okay, so God, God, back in the Old Testament, knew that he would have to justify, um, save through salvation, the, the Gentiles, through faith, he therefore preached that unto Abraham, back in the Old Testament. Okay, so Abraham was preached the same gospel. Now, now logically, it kind of makes sense, because in our um, Luke now I'll go back. But in our Luke quotation of that quotation, quotation of Isaiah, it said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? To preach the gospel unto the poor. So that same spirit, so, so Christ preached the same thing that God has commanded him to preach. And God previously taught the same thing to Abraham. But here we have a little clue at the end of verse 8. In thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. So, that's back in Genesis chapter 12. If you all want to turn that, we'll be there in about two, three slides time. But we're going to look at this man, Abraham. Well, how was the gospel preached unto Abraham? If the, thing, if the gospel is something that, that Jesus taught, that, that's the very stereotypical thing. But yet the gospel goes all the way back, back to Abraham, which God preached unto Abraham. So who was Abraham? Well, the biblical record in Genesis 12 um, through to chapter 24 um, Abraham originally lived, lived in the Ur of the Chaldees. I have a map on the next slide to get your geographical reference. Um, Abraham was called by God to leave Ur and travel to a land that God would show him. He didn't know his destination. God said, get thee out of thy country from thy kindred from thy, from thy father's house to a land that I'll show thee. And so Abraham had to leave, not knowing where he was going, to a land that God would show him. Eventually, we find the record, he was brought to the land of Canaan, which is the land of Israel today, also on the next slide. And there in the land of Canaan, in the land of Israel, he was given a number of promises based on his faithful walk before God. And these include a promise of a seed. That's kind of important. Um, Genesis chapter 12. But firstly, here's our map for geographical reference. Uh, the Chaldees down in Iran, Iraq, by the Persian Gulf. He moved, uh, traveled all the way up to Haran and then down into Jerusalem, um, the land of Canaan, which is now Israel today. Uh, we have the, the River Nile, it's Egypt, Cyprus, Turkey up here. So very much the Middle East, as you know it today. But a couple of things, apart from the, the story of Abraham's life, we have just a couple of extra things. Abraham became the father of the Jewish people. Um, you're probably well acquainted with what, what the Jewish faith is. Um, but Abraham, uh, his son was Isaac. His son was Jacob, or nation, oh, his, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And then Jacob had the 12 sons, which then turned into 12 tribes, which then turned into Israel. Um, so any Jewish person, um, our father is Abraham, pretty much. Abraham had his name changed from Abram to Abraham. Abraham was known as the friend of God, although that's found in James chapter 2, verse 23, which is not in the Genesis record, but we find out afterwards. Uh, Abraham was known as great man of faith, also in Hebrews 11. And Abraham died without inheriting any of the land he was promised. So we're just going to concentrate on those promises to Abraham. If you turn to Genesis chapter 12 with me, um, we're just going to go through these promises uh, as that was the gospel preached to Abraham, was it not? So if you turn up to Genesis chapter 12, we're going to try and work out how was the gospel preached unto Abraham with our little clue that all families of the earth should be blessed. So Genesis chapter 12, uh, verse 3, at the bottom of the screen, we have, in these shall all families of the earth be blessed. That's our exact same phrase. So we're in the same area. 
Um, this is what Paul was directing us to back in Galatians. So if you read Genesis 12, 1 to 3, Now the Lord said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, to a land that I will show thee. I will make thee a great nation, I will bless thee, I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee, curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Okay, so um, I'm just going to break these down, the promises to Abraham, into different categories. So the first one we have is the personal promises in verse 1 to 3. I'll bless them that bless thee, make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. These three you can read in the life of Abraham. These are all fulfilled. Um, Abraham, of, of his wealth uh, that he had and the land he had. Um, so he indeed was blessed. His name was great, and he was a blessing. And then we have these, almost you could say, so if we've gone personal to family, family promises that I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curseth thee. And God was, was with Abraham throughout his whole, whole life. Regardless of what Abraham did, God was there to bless him and to curse those who didn't. And so we've gone from personal to family to, to a national promise. I'll make thee a great nation. As I said previously, um, the Jews derive from Abraham. They say, we have Abraham to our father. Because Abraham had Isaac, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob the 12 tribes of Israel, and then Israel was born as a nation. So that is also fulfilled. But yet we have this international promise at the end, whereas in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now, I can't really think of an instance in which that would be fulfilled. If you know the history of Israel, you have the, uh, uh, from Jacob or Israel, you have the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, all the way through to David, who conquered the land, slew all the other uh, nations, rid them out of Israel, and then Solomon reigned in a peace in Israel. But yet, that's not all families of the earth. And then further down the line, um, the Babylonians took uh, Israel, but then Israel got it back, then the Romans seized it, seized it in 80 to 70, and they weren't back in the land until Balfour Declaration 1948, where, as we know, in 2022, there is a nation of Israel, which is known as the Jews' land. But there's a further promise, if you scan your eye down to verse 7 in Genesis chapter 12, um, that the Lord appears unto Abraham in, in verse 7, and he says unto him, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there he, Abraham, built an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So Abraham worshipped God for this another promise, Unto thy seed will I give this land. Now, if you think of a third, fourth generation, um, even to the time of David, yes, Abraham's literal seeds did inherit the land. But it's not quite what, um, what God intended when he spoke unto Abraham, as our reading in Galatians chapter 3 says. So if you turn back to Galatians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul expounds on this particular promise. So back in Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, we have this seed, as in Genesis 12, verse 7. But Paul says uh, in verse 16 of Galatians chapter 3, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said not to seeds as of many. So he didn't say to the seeds as in your literal generation, third, fourth generation, which is the 12 tribes of Israel. But as to seeds as of many, but as to one and to thy seed, which is Christ. So the promise that God made back in Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, God said that thy individual seed will inherit this land. Okay, so we're at this point where Abraham had this um, promise made to him that in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. That is not yet fulfilled. And yet what Paul is saying here, that God made a promise that thy seed, which is Christ, shall inherit the land. But yet that is not fulfilled yet. So in this in this predicament here where we, we still don't have these promises fulfilled, even though the majority are, but we have a few which don't. So then when will these promises be fulfilled? And that's where you and I come in. Or, what, or in a sense, we could ask, well, what does the gospel mean for us? How, how are we involved in these promises to Abraham and Christ being the seed who will inherit the land? Well, Galatians 3 actually picks this up. That's why we had it as a reading. Um, Galatians 3, verse 26 and 27, at the end of the chapter, it says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. 
now this is casting in mind back to 10 minutes or so, um, so ago, where those of you uh, who are being baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So the Mark 16 reference, Mark 16 verse 16, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. So he who is in this mortal state uh, of death, he who believes in the things concerning the name of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God and is baptized through into the Saviour, um, into the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, in the process of salvation, shall be in the state of eternal life and life everlasting. And so, if you're baptised, you're therefore the children of God in faith, by faith, in Christ Jesus. And just to kind of reiterate this, there's neither Jew nor Greek, so it doesn't matter if you're the seed of Abraham, it doesn't matter if you're not the seed of Abraham. There's neither bond nor free, male or female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. So, quite clearly it says that if you're baptised you're in Christ Jesus no matter of your background but then verse 29 in Galatians chapter 3 goes on to say if you be Christ so if you're baptised and you're in Christ then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to his promise so if you're baptised in Christ you're therefore um, partakers of the promises to Abraham and therefore heirs according to those promises. So, therefore, we are both um, heirs to the promise to Abraham and the promise of the seed. So, the, the promise of the, in these shall all families of the earth be blessed. We, we are um, heirs to that promise. Also to the promise that if you be Christ, because we are baptised, therefore um, we are also the seed that in, shall inherit the land, the land of Israel, um, which we'll go on to look look at so that's kind of where we fit in so then if that kingdom is to come if we're to be the nation um, the the fulfillment of all nations being blessed and we shall inherit the land as Christ will or we, we should we could have probably looked at this at the very start but it all comes back to God's purpose with the earth that's why there's a gospel uh, Isaiah 45, back in, uh, back in the very start, when God created the earth, he said, For thus saith the Lord God that created the heavens, he himself formed the earth, he made it, he established it, he created it, not in vain. He didn't make it like one of those wind up toys and do, 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 off it goes. He made it not in vain, but he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. He formed it to be inhabited by people of this everlasting life who have gone through that process of salvation. Numbers 14 verse 21, the, the promise uh, back in the time of Moses, as truly as I live, the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. So if that's the ultimate um, end in which the earth shall be, the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord because it's inhabited by people with the same characteristics, the same nature as our Lord God. Now we have lectures completely on God's purpose and plan with the earth. Um, which you're more than welcome to find on our website or, or speak to me afterwards and I can point in that way. But the whole point of the, the, the salvation in, in Jesus Christ, just go from this mortal life through the process of salvation if, in our Saviour, which is enabled by our Saviour, Jesus Christ, to the point of immortality and life everlasting in his kingdom. That is the point in which the promises fulfilled to Abraham in these short families of the earth be blessed, we shall inherit the land, and this is the time when it should be inhabited by God's glory filling the earth. And that, surprise, surprise, is the second point of the gospel, is it not the things concerning the kingdom of God? Now, as we saw at the start, Jesus preached the gospel, and therefore Jesus had to believe in this kingdom. Probably the easiest way to show this is the commonly known Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 to 13, Our Father, which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So Jesus believed in this coming kingdom because he he's set an example for his disciples to pray for God's kingdom to come. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So Jesus believed in this coming kingdom to come. He, he, he preached the gospel of the kingdom, as we saw at the start. So then, 
if we have a kingdom, surely we need a king. And Christ believes that he would be king. As in um, John 17, verse 18, uh, John 18, verse 37, um, this is when Christ is on trial uh, before his crucifixion. Pilate says unto him, Art thou a king then? Are you a king? It says it in plain Aramaic, would have been, but plain English. Um, Jesus answered, he said, Thou sayest that I am a king, and to this end was I born, and this cause I came to the world. Jesus literally says, You say I'm a king, and I was born a king, and this is the reason I came into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. So that kingdom to come, Christ is to be king. That's the whole point of the gospel. But as we saw, the gospel, the things concerning Jesus Christ was in the Old Testament. I want to prove that the kingdom of God is also in the Old Testament. So there's two things, the name of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God, found in Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. And we actually have a whole lecture on this verse. Um, so uh, this, I only have one slide again, but that's the wonderful thing about the gospel. It encapsulates so many things. Um, but Daniel 2, verse 44, in, and in the days of these kings... Shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces, consume all these kingdoms, and shall stand forever. So in Daniel chapter 2, we have Nebuchadnezzar's image. If you remember that, you're familiar with the, the head of gold, which is the Babylonians, you have the Medes and Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, and then the uh, nations with the Roman thinking. Um, and then a stone cut without hands, out of a mountain comes and destroys that image and that stone grows into a mountain that fills the whole earth and has this been yet fulfilled no it hasn't because there's no kingdom on earth which god rules and it shall consume all the current kingdoms on the earth now i don't know there's what 70 odd nations around the earth probably a bit of my estimation but all those kingdoms are not one united kingdom UK, but that's a different thing. Um, and it shall stand forever. There's no kingdom that would last forever. So then if we got the things concerning the kingdom of God, well, what will this kingdom be like? And I just have the one um, slide on this, but if, if you want to turn back to Isaiah 35 with me, Isaiah 35 is a beautiful chapter which shows um, or speaks of the time what, of what the kingdom will be like. Isaiah 35. It's, it's a lovely 10 verse little chapter. But Isaiah 35, the wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them. The desert shall um, rejoice and bloom as the rose. So the, the desert parched land will, will bring forth abundance. It, verse 2 says, it shall bloom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. Um, verse, verse 3, we have strengthen ye the weak hands, confirm the feeble knees. Say to them who have a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. There's no fear in the kingdom. For God at the end of verse 4 will come and save you. Verse 5, there's no more physical ailments because the, the eyes of the blind are opened, the ears of the deaf are unstopped. Verse 6, the lame man leaps like a heart, the tongue of the dumb shall sing. And in the wilderness, waters break out and streams into desert. Parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water, and the inhabitation of dragons which lay shall the grass and the reeds and um, shall be grass and reeds with reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there, it should be called the way of holiness, and the unclean shall not pass over it. So the way of holiness for those who believed and baptized. Verse 9 No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast. They shall be found, but the redeemed shall walk there in this kingdom. And the ransom of the Lord, those who are saved, those who are in this, this place of everlasting life because they've gone through that process of salvation, the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs of everlasting joy upon their heads for all, and shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing. And death, as uh, Revelation puts it, shall flee away. So there'll be no more this state of, of death for those who have gone through the process of our salvation and are in this state of immortality shall obtain this life everlasting and they're those which have emulated the the characteristics manifested the characteristics of god 
So now we've gone through um, the things concerning the name of Jesus Christ and things concerning the kingdom of God, and we understand what the gospel is. Well, what do we do with the gospel? And we've inadvertently answered this in Mark 16. Again, um, verse 15, he said, unto them, the, God, the um, disciples that understood the gospel, he said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature, uh, every creature being every human being. So, all those here, you, you understand what the gospel is after we've gone through it tonight, and therefore our obligation is to go preach it to the world. And everyone that believes believes in the gospel, the gospel which has the power to salvation, goes through the process of baptism and will be in that, um, uh, sorry, verse 16 says, he that believes goes through that process, shall be saved, shall be in the state of life, in, uh, immortality and life everlasting. But he that doesn't believe in the gospel, doesn't believe in the power to salvation, shall just remain in this state of death and mortality. It's literally a choice of life and death, the gospel. If you don't believe, aren't baptised, you remain in this state of death. But belief and baptism, by God's grace, will give you life everlasting. Now, for the next five, ten minutes or so, it's a wonderful thing that we've learnt tonight. It's great in head knowledge. But is the gospel only a doctrine? Is it something, ah, oh, yes, I believe in the coming kingdom. I believe that Jesus Christ said these things. He preached the good news of the kingdom. I believe, got baptised, therefore I am now in this camp of life everlasting. Well, quite plainly, it doesn't say that. 1 Corinthians 9, 14, Even so hath the Lord ordained, because the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jesus, who preached the gospel, that they which preach the gospel, so that's everyone here, as we saw in the last, last slide, everyone who preaches the gospel should live the gospel. And just to kind of reiterate this in Mark 8 verse 34, this is talking about the gospel as it says at the end, for whosoever will save his life, this life being um, the life now while you're in this state of mortality and death, he shall lose it if you're, if you're trying to save this life, as in um, not literally life and death if you die um, for the kingdom of God's sake or not, but it can be pursuits of this life, what you must do, what you must see, have, go places um, and get if those, you pursue those, things, pursue those things, you shall lose your life, that being your eternal life. But whosoever shall lose his life, so not pursuing the, the things of this world, so uh, the things you must see, the things you must have, go places and do. If he says, if that person says, I don't want that life because I'm striving for this life of immortality, because of the sake of the gospel, so for the sake, my sake and the gospels, the same shall save that eternal life. So, isn't a way of life something you do? As in a sense, life isn't saying, oh yeah, I know I have to go to work today, I know I have to go, go pay my taxes or, or whatever mundane things everyday life is. Life is something you do. So, you need, um, those who preach the gospel has to live the gospel. So, I just want to kind of point out that the gospel isn't something you should know, it's something you walk. The Probably the best um, verse that supports this is Romans chapter 6, which is a very well uh, known chapter that we read uh, baptisms. That so many of you as were baptized into Christ, so you, you say you believe, you're baptin baptized into Christ, you're baptized into Christ's death. And that's why Christ is the Savior in this process of salvation. Therefore, we've been buried by baptism into his death. That like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should all walk, the doing word, in newness of life. So once we go, okay, yep, I believe, I'm baptised, we're then to commence a walk that looks towards that time, that kingdom which we looked at, very briefly, of that life everlasting. And so we don't go, cool, I've been, I'm at this process of salvation, I've been baptised, now I know I'm in that camp, so I'm just going to go, sit and pursue the things of this world well that wasn't what our last verse uh, our last slide said so once we believe once baptized we have to walk in newness of life for if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death we shall be in the likeness of his christ's resurrection and what is the likeness of christ well galatians 2 verse 20 uh, con um, continue on a similar theme I am crucified with Christ. So I'm baptized. I, Daniel, I'm, cru I'm crucified. Daniel's dead. 
Nevertheless, not I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. So I am to walk as if uh, in the footsteps of Christ, for we are to follow the footsteps of our master. And that is the outworking of the gospel. So once we're baptized, we have to walk and live out the gospel. For the walk, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith, the same key words popping up, of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself to me. And that is the process of salvation through Christ's death and resurrection. Uh, we're not going to touch on it tonight, but that is a very key part of, of the gospel almost. Um, but nevertheless, to reiterate my point, that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Okay, we've got promises again. Um, back in the time of Abraham, that um, unto thy seed do I give this land, and in all thee, in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So he's not slack. He, he, God remembers those promises. But God is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish. So he's not wanting anyone to stay in this camp of death and mortality. He's wanting all that come to repentance. So everyone to believe, everyone to be baptized, and therefore come to the state of life, immortality and everlasting life. And that's our obligation, is it not? To go preach the gospel to every creature in the earth. Verse 13, 2 Peter chapter 3, nevertheless we, according to his, God's promises, we look for that new heaven and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. That kingdom of God, which is the key aspect of the gospel. So literally, baptism is the start of the process of salvation. And it says that I believe, and it's also a commencement to living the gospel. And so we come to our a final slide for tonight which hopefully encapsulates a lot of what we've talked about in 2 Peter chapter 1 of our hope and high, our high calling uh, so um, starting in verse 3 um, his God's divine power hath given us all things that pertain to life and goodliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to virtue the knowledge uh, of, of Christ for we must know the things pertain to the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ he called us unto the glory and virtue of that kingdom, whereby we're given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, the promises made back unto Abraham. And by these, you might be partakers of divine nature, the divine nature of immortality through the process of salvation, having escaped the corruption, the death of this world that we all are in this state because we all need saving. And verse 10 goes on to say, wherefore rather, brethren, Give diligence to make sure your calling and election is sure. Your calling, because you know about this gospel, make it sure that you go through this process of salvation to inherit life everlasting. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you more abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And so I implore you tonight that you not only heard these things, but to, to go, understand the gospel, go have a look for yourself, try and understand the process of salvation, because that is what gets you from, from the state of death, which we're all in now. Um, and that process of salvation to get to life everlasting, that we make sure our calling and election is sure, and that we may enter into that everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Thanks.